settled um wow thank you Oklahoma City like it feels good coming home today's theme for creative mornings is game so I was trying to like reach way back in my memory and through my experience think about when was the first time that I felt I really had game and I feel like did anyone see Desmond Mason like the first creative mornings like this should have been his talk but Whatever, I can do it. So, can you all see the slides? I can, I can tell you what's on it. There's a bunch of really scrawny 10-year-olds <laughs> in yellow shirts holding basketball trophies. I am on the bottom left, like probably the most excited. And I started playing basketball, I, I mean, look at me. Like, I wasn't very good at it, <laughs> as you can probably imagine. But I threw myself into it, and I wasn't the best by any means, but I actually played with the best. There was a girl on my team named Shanna Harmon. Do any of you happen to know her? I feel like Oklahoma is so small. So, <laughs> so I grew up with Shanna, and she was naturally tall and talented. Oh, wait, uh, where, am I on the slide? Oh, sorry, my slide is missing. But it's okay, it's all good, it's all good. Shanna was really tall and talented and just naturally gifted and she truly did have game. And she went on to get scholarships in college and was probably gonna play for the WNBA but hurt her back. She was incredibly great. And I remember one time on my way home, my parents came to every game, we were driving home in like the old Subaru Justy and my dad goes, you know Kathleen, you did something really great today. And I was like, because I kind of knew that I sucked at basketball. I was like, what did I do? He was like, you did something really good in the game today. You were really good at throwing the ball in from the sidelines. <laughs> and even at the time, I was like, that's kind of a weird compliment. <laughs> but I'm going to take it. And so... I kind of felt like a badass with game, and I've been trying to ride that vibe for the rest of my life. Like, if I'm gonna be good at anything, like, let's just be good at throwing the ball in from the sideline, right? But I will say today, I do kind of feel like I've got some game. I've been able to accomplish some really cool things professionally and personally. I'm about to share some of those with you, and then I'm gonna share you some of the tools and tactics that I've used in order to feel good about throwing the ball in from the sidelines. So today I feel like I've got game because I just published a book last week with Running Press. Thanks. I've been on tour promoting it. I have a podcast with over five million downloads. Me and my co-host, okay, so just to show you what's on this slide, it's a slide of me like throwing a parade in New Orleans, wearing a full on body glitter suit with a big for a caller, and there's about 75 creative entrepreneurs behind me. And every year, I like to go on vacation with my co-host of the podcast, and we like to invite our listeners to come with us. And a couple of years ago, we were like, hey, wouldn't it be fun, we were going to Miami, wouldn't it be fun to party on a yacht with like all of our creative entrepreneurs? We're like, yeah, how do we make that happen? So I called one of our partners, FreshBooks Cloud Accounting, and I felt like I was like calling my mom and dad, like asking for, like my rich mom and dad, I was like, hey, can we party on a yacht? Can you guys pay for it? And they said, yeah. And so then last year I was like, can we throw a parade in New Orleans? Like, could, would that be fun? They were like, yeah, let's do it. I own a branding studio here in Oklahoma City with a couple of badass partners. And I love the work that we do. We just opened a space in the Paseo and it's exactly how I would have imagined it. It's filled with plants and wicker furniture, I love it. 
So professionally, I feel like I've done some pretty cool things. And personally, I feel like I've had a few like cool personal accomplishments as well. I hiked to Mount Everest base camp with my sexy husband. And that was a lot of fun. I once went swimming in a cenote in Mexico. Now, what you're going to see here is a photo of me looking like a mermaid underwater and like arched back. This is actually a photo that my friend Missy took in her pool. This was not the cenote. <laughs> the actual cenote looked like this. And for those of you who can't see it, it looks like, it looks like I'm swimming in Lake Thunderbird. <laughs> and apparently after I got out of the cenote, the guy who owned it told me that there were alligators in it. So like, let's just say my accomplishment was swimming in a lake in Mexico with alligators. I once jumped out of a plane. And what you see up here is a guy jumping out of a plane. That is not me. Like That footage is stuck on a VHS tape somewhere. And I have no desire to ever watch it again. But I do feel like if I'm on Amazing Race any day now, um, I'll, I'll do it again. One of my biggest achievements and personal accomplishments was pushing this baby out of my body, <laughs> on my bed, at home. Yeah, it was no joke. But one of my coolest memories, well, OK, first let me tell you about my dad. And what you might see up here, if you can see it, if you can't see it, let me describe it. It's my dad with like a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. And he's holding a fish. He's on a boat. He's holding a fish. And he's wearing these coveralls and like a hat, like a, co a cowboy hat. I don't think it's even technically. OK. So you know he's kind of like this. He's wearing these coveralls. And he's been wearing these coveralls his whole life, before we were born. And you can see here, he's still holding a fish, but he's also surrounded by his children. <laughs> That's me that he's holding there. I'm looking at this fish that he's, so he's holding me in one arm. He's holding a fish in another. And I'm looking at this fish like, oh my god. <laughs> but what you can see here is that he's also wearing coveralls. And this is my same dad that was like, you're really good at throwing the ball in from the sidelines. Like, this is him just a couple years ago at the medieval fair in Norman in coveralls. <laughs> like, and for those of you who can't see, it's like the Dickies, like zip up, utility coveralls. And he's shopping for a dragon statue, which is pretty much life goals, right? So I think that my dad has sometimes felt like a little bit like an outcast or a little different because he rocks this coverall style, right? And it's most pronounced whenever we all go to Disney World together as a family. And we are like definitely a Disney family. Sorry, not sorry. And one year we were all at Disney World. And we've been going since we were kids. And now we take our kids. And we're still taking my parents. And he goes, you know what? I'd like you kids to find just one other person wearing my style, my coveralls. I bet you can't do it. So we looked. We looked. We were trying to spy just one other like old fisherman in coveralls at Disney World. We couldn't find it. So a couple of years later, I coordinated for all of us to show up <laughs> in coveralls. So for those of you who can't see, this is my whole family wearing red coveralls, including at the time my eight-month-old baby. So I'm sharing all of these personal and even professional accomplishments because this is the highlight reel. Like This is what we're all seeing on Instagram. This is the stuff that I want to be known for. This is the stuff that I'm personally proud of. And there could be a whole other Creative Mornings talk about comparison, I'm sure, where I could even feel bad about what I've done because it's not enough, right? But what I want to talk about today is throwing the ball in from the sidelines and really just showing up for the game and being proud of what you've got. And so I've shared the good stuff, right? I'm going to share a few of the behind the scenes of like what didn't work out. So this is me and my sister auditioning for Creative Mornings seven years ago. I rewatched the video in preparation for this, and we were practically apologizing for auditioning. It was so 
bad. <laughs> and the thing is, is that at the time, for those of you who can't see, this is me and my sister. And my sister's like zoning out, like thousand yard stare. And I'm, I'm making this face. And then it's like WTF and I, I don't know. Um, at the time that I auditioned, we, we really truly weren't ready for it. We didn't have a voice yet. But I do believe that you find your voice by using your voice. And I feel like today I've got a little bit more to say. Maybe not much more. But let's keep going. I went sincerely auditioned for America's Next Top Model. It was cycle six, 2005. My sister, big theme in all of this, drives me to Cable Volkswagen with my portfolio of like underwear shots and I don't know. Um, I like model walked to the News 9 camera. I thought I was gonna make it. Like, and I know I'm not nearly skinny enough or beautiful enough or symmetrical enough to be a model, but I thought it would be such a fun experience. I thought it would be so cool to like dress up and take cool photos and learn how to smize. Um, I didn't make it on America's Next Top Model, but as Hetty mentioned, I get a model for Shopgood. So this is the first shoot that I did with Shopgood. And they've become some of my best friends since. And I remember at the time, I was like, okay, I've made it. Designer slash model. <laughs> my friend Greer likes to take me to like random locations out in the middle of deserts and take photos. I've gotten to take some really cool photos for my work with Being Boss. Um, I set off smoke bombs, like, oh, so you all can't see, but I set off smoke bombs in, s in the park in New Orleans, and I thought I was going to get arrested doing that, but took some cool photos. You can kind of also see my hair journey here. For those of you who can't see, like, it's changed so much, so big shout out to Adrian. So I didn't make it on America's Next Top Model, but I got to do some cool shoots and have the experience anyway. And I mentioned earlier that I've got a book deal, right? I blogged for 10 years without a single dollar, no monetizing, before I ever got that book deal. And the book deal didn't even come from the blog. It came from podcasting. So who knew? There was a lot of just like showing up every single day. That really cool parade in New Orleans that we threw. So me and my co-host of Being Boss, we tried throwing a weekend workshop about four years ago, and like this vacation to New Orleans, it sells out like hotcakes. Like with the, by the time we launch the cart, it's sold out usually within a week. We tried to launch a weekend workshop and not a single person signed up. Well, okay, maybe one did and we had to refund them their money. Like that's even worse than nobody signing up. It's being like, sorry, no one else signed up. Here's your money back. But just like you find your voice by using your voice, I think that you, Find your game by playing the game. And there's no secret, there's no blueprint to having any amount of success. I really think it's about just showing up and if the only thing that you're good at is throwing the ball in from the sidelines, then just try to be the best at that. And just be brave enough to show up. So what I really wanna tell you today are a few of my top tips and tactics for having, like cultivating that courage to show up and to just even own my own experiences, whatever they might be, and to celebrate them along the way. So number one is to make a list. I'm, you guys, I'm getting really practical here, so feel free to like get out your notebooks and write it down. Or not, this is recorded. You'll be able to watch it later. Um, so the first is to make a list. So what I want you to do today is make a list of 100 things that you want to do or see or experience, or it could even people be people that you want to collaborate with, it can be as specific or as broad as you'd like. It doesn't have to be professional, it could be personal, it could be anything. So for example, here are maybe a few things on your list, or on my list. Be a backup dancer for Beyonce. So it can also be like wildly improbable, right? It can be anything. Um, it might be eating sushi in Tokyo. It might be finally opening that storefront. It could be meeting Oprah. Maybe it's like pulling a Cheryl Strait and hiking the Pacific Coast Trail. And maybe it's driving a Tesla or engineering a Tesla. 
So here's how this works. You write down all the things that you want to do, a hundred of them, and you might have to stretch your imagination a little bit. And the cool thing about the list is that you can kind of just forget about it at that point. Like I know that a lot of us like to muscle our way through to the success, but what I found with the list is that you can write it down and file it away. And so a lot of the things that I mentioned before were things that were on my list that I kind of forgot about. So be on America's Next Top Model. I wasn't on America's Next Top Model, but I did get to do some cool shoots, right? Another way that this might work out is I'm trying to think of another experience that maybe I've had where I've written something down on a list. So, oh, one time I wrote down, I was just going through an old notebook the other day, and I wrote down, I want to be able to travel and get paid to travel. And so in my mind, I imagine this playing out like I'm a travel journalist, and maybe I'm going to really interesting destinations, and people are paying me to write about it in a magazine that you would find like in a pocket of an airline, like in one of those magazines. Or maybe I'm blogging about it. And so I was going through my notebook, and just the other day I opened it and saw that get paid to travel. And I thought, wow. Like, just in the past two weeks, I've been on top of the Empire State Building, and I've also been exploring the Redwoods. And I got paid to do that from writing a book. So I get paid to travel, and it didn't happen the way that I expected it to. But I think that if you can make a list, you can expect that everything that you write down is going to make its way to you in one way or another. All right, after you make a list, you've got to make space. So after we launched Braid Creative, we like got the website up, we got some blog posts going, the branding was awesome, there was a lot of excitement. Once the confetti settled, it was like crickets chirping, no clients. Like, oh my gosh, what do we do now? So we were working with an executive coach, and I told him, I'm kind of freaking out about not having clients, what do I do? And he was like, you got to make space for them. I like looked around my office and I was like, um, there's space, like bring it. And he was like, the universe abhors a vacuum. He's like real woo woo. And I was like, I, I need you to like tell me what you mean. And he was like, okay, get out like a piece of like foam core board or poster board and draw blank spaces on it. And that's space for your clients. And then they'll come and you write in their names on the spaces. And I was like, mm. So I had this chalkboard wall that I used to take my photos against. And I got out a piece of chalk, and I drew 10 blank spots. And then my coach was like, oh, you also have to do a mantra. And I was like, OK, I've got dream clients with cash, like just ready to pay me. I, we drew a magnet with hearts around it and like a Cupid's arrow through the magnet. Like we were just attracting this. Um, so made space. Two weeks later, the chalkboard was filled up with clients. Now, I think that this works in a couple of ways. Like one, it makes your goals super visual and in your face. So looking at blank spaces for what you want can be incredibly daunting and incredibly confronting. But what you're going to do from that is send out those emails, write that content. You're going to be doing the things that it takes to achieve what it takes to fill that space. But then I also think that there's a little bit of magic to it. So a lot of people ask me, OK, I've made the lines, or no, they haven't done that yet. They've said, OK, I get it. I get the chalkboard. We call it the chalkboard method. I get it, but how do you actually fill those spaces Like once I make it? And I always ask them, did you actually make the space? Did you draw your lines? No. OK, we'll try that first and then see what happens. So I think that there is this like little bit of magical compo component to committing to drawing those blank spaces. So you all can do this like on anything. It can be on poster board. It can be a on a chalkboard. You could even get out, like I know a jeweler who hanged her jewelry and then had a little postcard underneath each one. And then for every piece that she sold, she filled in the client's name or the order like on the postcard under the jewelry. So you can get really creative with it. I know someone else who wanted to sell 100 courses. They took a canvas and painted 100 polka dots on it and then filled in each polka dot for each course that they sold. So you can get really creative with it. But this is something that we still do to this day is the chalkboard, and I really do think it works. OK, the next thing that you want to do whenever you're really trying to muster up courage to show up and throw the ball in and do the thing is to have a dinner party. So for those of you who I cannot see, here's who I like to invite to my dinner party <laughs> whenever I'm unsure or in doubt. And so what I've got here is Beyonce. 
even if just she showed up, like we're good. I've got Jennifer Lawrence, Cardi B, Meryl Streep, Kanye West, and Bernie Sanders. This is a pretty interesting dinner party, right? So whenever I'm freaking out a little bit, I like to invite these six guests over to my house. And we all sit down, and I'm like, okay, here's my challenge. I'm kind of freaking out about this talk I have to give at Creative Mornings. Am I, am I, are there too many photos of myself in my slides? And Kanye's like, no. <laughs> You're good. You're good. So, but what I want you to do is think about who would you invite to your dinner party? And so obviously, I'm not actually having these people over at my house for dinner one day. That's on my list. Um, but what they do is that they give me inspiration and courage to show up. So what I want you to do is think of maybe like four to six people or even archetypes that you would invite over for dinner. And then I want you to get really specific about their expertise, about what their values are. I want you to get specific about um, maybe even what they're wearing and then the kind of advice that they would give to you. And what's really cool is to even think about the conversations that these people are having with each other. So I've got um, Cardi B and Bernie Sanders sitting next to each other at my dinner party. Like, what kind of conversation are they having? And what would that be like? And it's a really cool way to connect dots and to also bring more aspects of yourself and to give yourself permission to try a lot of different things. I'm sure that all of us here are creative and sometimes feel funny about like having lots of different interests and is it okay to veer off path a little bit. I think that these guests give you a little bit of courage to do that, to try new things. Okay, so one time I was coaching a client and we went through six weeks of like breaking down, limiting beliefs, and she really wanted to write a book. This is what she wanted to do. She wanted to write a book and I was like, okay, then s you know, let's get some productivity habits in place, like maybe just block off two hours every morning to write your book. And after six weeks of resistance, like a resistance that we all know too well of not doing the thing, I was like, okay, this, I'm going to break all of like coaching rules and I'm just going to give you like what works for me. And it's kind of remembering that we're all going to die. So why not make the thing? So my fourth tactic is remember that you only live once. And in fact, I go on a walk every single day by this graveyard, and I remember that there's not a lot of time. In fact, last night I had insomnia thinking about this slide, and I was like, oh my gosh, what if like I manifest like an early, like I hope this isn't it, you guys, but if it is, I feel good, like we've made something good today. Um, so I think it's just like really remembering like there's really not enough time, and also like if we make a mistake or embarrass ourselves, we're all gonna die. I know that's really morbid, but like, let's just let's just do the thing. All right. Finally, the last thing that I really want you to do whenever it comes to cultivating courage to play the game is to celebrate your wins along the way. This is so incredibly important, and this is coming back to that comparison trap thing. Like, you can easily look at somebody else and say, you know, oh well. Maybe I've got five million downloads, but they've got a hundred. I think I read this morning Tim Ferriss has a hundred million downloads. Is that a billion? Is that a hundred million is a billion? Anyway, there's a lot of zeros in there. So I could easily feel bad about my accomplishments, right? Like so easily. And here's another photo of me playing basketball. Like I don't even think we won. I think that that's like one of those pity trophies. That's right but I still felt good about it. And this is what I've been trying to do. Like anytime I really feel down, I realize that I'm not celebrating the wins along the way and being enthusiastic about it. And truly, I think that the little wins add up. And that whenever you can cultivate that feeling of success along the way, you start to attract more of it to you. And on your own terms, whatever that really looks like for you. So ultimately, you just gotta play the game. Throw that ball in. Thank you. I did. And it's so funny because, oh, so Cardi B made a comment about social security and Bernie Sanders retweeted her. And it's so funny because I had just made that slide probably three days before. So, yeah. 
I made that happen. You're welcome, <laughs> Cardi B and Bernie. Okay, so Hetty asked, like, what are some big changes that we made at Braid Creative to have what we have now, which is an office and some cool clients and whatever. Um, so honestly, there weren't a lot of big changes. It was just a lot of persistence and consistency, and I think that that's a big part of showing up, right? And so we all see the overnight successes, but it takes 10 years to get there, right? 10 years of blogging to get that book. 10 years of just grinding away one client at a time to get that office. So I think that for me, it wasn't a big change. It was really staying consistent in what we offer and do. We've offered the same thing for seven years. We have one package, and we will scale it accordingly to if we're working with a creative entrepreneur or a larger organization or even like a financial institution. Um, but we have made some big leaps this year specifically um, that feel bigger than ever. So we brought on a third partner, Holly Arder. I think they had to sneak out for a meeting. But we brought on a third partner. Um, we've been staffing up our team a little bit more and really just making that leap of like, okay, we're investing in this office space. Let's do it. How do we afford it? So I think that that's probably the biggest thing is just those little, it's like little steps along the way. I like to think of it like this, is if you're building a bridge across like a big chasm, is that the right word for like a big, okay. So like think about just putting down one plank at a time, right, as you're going. And then maybe at the very end you run out of planks, but you're almost there and you just have to jump like five feet and you're like, will my legs, will my legs reach? Am I gonna fall? I think that's what it kind of feels like whenever you take those like bigger little leaps along the way. Number one thing I do to deal with fear. So I definitely have fear. Um, I, I would have to say the YOLO, like remembering that I'm gonna die. I know, I know it's, I have this sense of urgency and I was actually just having coffee with a friend of mine who does some video for us and he told me this really horrific story of being on a shoot and almost dying on it. Like he was shooting in a canoe and the canoe goes under into ice cold water He's got this red camera that he accidentally like clipped to his life jacket. So th the camera's like, dr I mean, it was traumatic. And um, so he's telling me this story and he's like, now I just know that like time is limited and I'm only gonna take on the projects that really matter, right? And really mean something. I just feel like life is too short. And I was like, man, what you're describing, I have felt this way since I was five years old without like that near-death experience. So for me, that's it. I think that that's, yeah, that's it. <laughs> so Sherry's asking about turning down work. Um, for me, lately, it's been really about, a lot of opportunities are coming up now with the book, and I've had some cool um, things come my way, and for me, it's really understanding my values and intentions. So really understanding what it is that I wanna create and narrowing in. So this is a little bit more like esoteric. It's more than like, I, I do branding, but I don't do websites. You know what I mean? Because that used to be the answer, right? Like we're not, or we're not a good fit if you don't wanna go through the process that we go through. But now it really is about values and it is about, okay, well the work that I do, like one of mine is, I know this word is so overused, but authenticity and kind of helping people be who they are 100% of the time. And I think of that a lot through the lens of personal branding. And so for me, if an opportunity comes up and it doesn't run through that filter of that value, it's a no. If, it's a, if it does help people, then it's a yes but in that very specific way. So I think as you narrow in on your values and what it is that you wanna do and make, it helps you make decisions a lot better as far as drawing that line in the sand of what you do and what you don't do. But again, the theme of this is showing up for the game, right? Like I've played a lot of sports that I've sucked at because like I didn't, I just wanna try it and see what sticks. So I think that there is like this experimental phase and I think it's a cycle of like trying things out and then seeing what sticks 
letting go of the things that don't, and you just go through that over and over. <laughs> I lost my voice in New York, like day one of the book tour. Um, I would, if I was just not starting, it would be creating content, which is probably the first step that I took then. So either blogging or podcasting or YouTubing, like doing something where I'm creating something that helps me find my voice, helps me explore some something creative, um, and would also help position me, not necessarily as an expert, because if you're just starting, you aren't, but it helps you explore that expertise that you want to be known for. So I think if I was just starting today, it would be creating content. <laughs> you can find my book at Commonplace Books. Yeah. Yeah. Do you still have some? Okay, there are rumors that they've sold out, but I don't think that's true. Okay, it's not true. Commonplace, they'll, and they'll order it for you if it's not there. Um, and then also, like, the, the big names, if you want to. Co common, uh, commonplace, of course. And if you could leave a, a review at Commonplace, just take, like, a little, like, shoe polish and just write it on their windows. <laughs> leave me a five-star review there. That would be amazing. so much.